I know I've told this story on several occasions, but it was back in the summer of 2010. The Thinking Atheist had been around for about a year. I had come out of FM radio many years ago and had just become introduced to internet radio. Wait, you can do a radio show online? How cool is that? And so I launched the Thinking Atheist radio show in late July of 2010, as I recall, and everybody said, your first guest should be a guy named Aaron Raw. And no offense, Aaron, but my first thought was, who? Aaron who? And uh, they had pointed me to the Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism video series, which I found very impressive, and I was honored that you joined me. And of course, we've since become good friends. Aaron, good to have you. How's it going, man? It's uh, always a pleasure, sir. You uh, are probably one of the big... I mean, I've been told that I'm busy, and then I'll see your travel schedule. Like, <laughs> how many cities did you do in Europe? Was it earlier this year, or was it last year, or both? What? It was both, actually. I did seven countries the first year and 15 countries the second year. And and that's that's not even including the, the four cities we did in Australia and uh, also in New Zealand and, it, it, and Canada and... Um, um, elsewhere. It, it's, it's been really crazy. The last couple of years of my life have been nuts. I mean, I've been to like 22 countries uh, in India and the Middle East. And uh, it's that that's, I, yeah, I've been busy. I, we did 15 countries in six weeks the last time I went to Europe. And I don't, I don't strongly endorse that unless you're in a rock and roll band. <laughs> well, even then, I mean, don't you become kind of <laughs> displaced? It's a little alienating in some ways. I mean, not when you're doing the event and you're surrounded by all of your friends and we make friends everywhere we go, but not being home, being in a different hotel or host family's house or just in a different location, you never get that root or anchor. Some people thrive on that, but it can also be something that really wears you down over time. It can be, and uh, fortunately, I just I love travel. I think I've got like twenty two or, or twenty spots uh, slotted for my book tour. You know, that's that that's crazy too. That's a five week road trip, and it, and it, and I've got a, a number of other gigs that I have upcoming in the year or upcoming for uh, two thousand seventeen. I should say that uh, I'm not going to be on quite so many airplanes. Um, by this point, it would have been forty four airplanes. So far this year, 45, I think. Airports I, just sure. suck the life right out of me. I mean, I, and I love <laughs> doing what I do. It's not even being on the plane. It's not driving to the airport. It's the waiting for the flight. It's the delays. It's the queues. It's checking in. It's, you know, TSA and it's airport food. You know, it's just, it just drains yeah, it, you. Nine dollars for a tuna salad sandwich, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to the foundational falsehoods, which is the reason we're talking today. Uh, set me up first with the video series. How did that come about? I know anybody can watch it online, but uh, give them an introduction here. Yeah, well, it was a couple of things that led to that. It was a, it was a friend of mine, one of my, my best friend in high school, uh, became a Southern Baptist minister here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And uh, I met with him once, you know, 20 years after high school or so. And he told me that I should write a book. And then I, I ended up with a conversation with, uh, with some, er, uh, some other girl at one point who was upset that I was wearing a Darwin t-shirt because, you know, she said, you can't prove evolutionism. And I said, well, actually, yes, I can. But the very fact that you call it evolutionism indicates what the problem is. And she goes, well, prove it. you can't prove evolution then because, you know, because uh, you'd have to prove there is no God. And I said, well, whether God exists or not is irrelevant. She hasn't met anybody from the Catholic Church. She certainly hasn't <laughs> talked to the Pope, right? They've embraced. I mean, it took them a long time, but they finally embraced evolution. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I can't, I can't prove evolution right now, uh, you know, as we're sitting here talking in a cafe. But if you'll give me some time, I'll put together a presentation that will give all the evidence you need. And uh, and that was the beginning of the Foundational Falsehoods sh series. I'm still stuck on the pastor who wanted you to write a book if he didn't think you were right, or was he an adherent to evolution? Uh, he taught his school taught that the Bible was the only source of truth in our world, and that all evidence of any kind must be re must be rejected if it contradicts their interpretation of sacred scripture. Sounds like Ken Ham. Yeah, he was a fan of Ken Ham and, and of Kent Hovind. There are some who say that 
Come on, creationism. Nobody teaches young Earth creationism anymore. Nobody thinks that the Earth is six or ten thousand years old. It's these are stories. Well, they're metaphors. They, nobody's a Bible literalist anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, Kent Hovind, for example, is trying to build yet another dinosaur adventure land, uh, playing on uh, believers who you know who will just give him tens of thousands of dollars or property or whatever it has that they can donate so that he can have this lucrative job that he doesn't actually have to work for or have training for. So what he's done is he's he's arranging to have local public schools. He's now located in Arkansas, just north of Pensacola, Florida. He's having local public schools bring field trips, just like he did in Pensacola, have school buses full of public school children show up to his dinosaur adventure land, where he admits that the only reason that this half-assed theme park exists is so that he can proselytize to other people's children and, quote, lead souls to the Lord. They say that this is done because it's critical to rescue young minds and young hearts and young souls mm -hmm. from the claws of the devil. Many of these people, I think, who teach creationism out there, I'm not going to speak to some of the, the apologists that we speak about that get under our skin because they're just, they make us crazy. But there are a lot of people who preach and teach creationism who are genuinely believing and embracing the narrative that these are the end of days, man. So we have to, it's critical. We have to go after the kids. Yeah, there are some people who, who sincerely believe, but those people are the ones that I find to be uh, deceived, misled. And there are the, then there are those for whom belief means something different than it does to you and I. But for me, a belief, what I believe is, uh, is a logical consequence of my understanding of the facts. And if I see facts that uh, indicate that I am wrong, well, then I have to consider those facts. And upon examination, if it turns out that that is the case, then I, I will change my mind. And it's not that I promise to change my mind. It's I have no choice. I cannot keep believing something that I know is not evidently true. It, I don't even have to have proof that it's wrong. It's enough that it is not evidently true, and I've already lost it. But faith-based believers have confessed many times that they will continue to believe whatever they want to believe, regardless what the facts are. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said two plus two equals five, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it. Uh, the, the best admission of that, and I've heard many, the best admission I've ever heard of that was um, one guy, at a, a minister giving a sermon to his own congregation said, I have evidence that A exists, but I prefer to believe B. Although everything points to A, I'm going with B. And I've gotten many other admissions that people believe what they want because they want, or, you know, for whatever reason, like I've heard people tell me that they believe what they do because they have to, because they want to, because I want to believe that I will see my dead son again, you know, something like that. These are not rational reasons. Now, the reason that I believe things is because evidence indicates that, but other people will believe, like Ken Ham, uh, CEO of Answers in Genesis, he says that if you want to believe in salvation, which is the second half of the Bible, then you have to believe in creation, which is the first half of the Bible. So you have to put on what he calls God glasses so that you can dismiss any and all evidence that stands against that and just make believe, and that's literally what it is, make believe that the Bible is correct. So there are people who believe as an act of will, of mind over matter, the power of positive thought, that you can change reality if you can believe hard enough. And so for them, believe is something different than it is for me. Didn't you post a meme or poster, or maybe it was something I saw in a speech? I don't know. I've, we crossed paths so many dozens of times on the road, but it was um, religious belief and fairy tales. And you did some sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I mentioned at that time was that uh, people often say that, uh, like Kent, uh, Kent Hovind, for example, his argument is that evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. But if you look at what the definition of a fairy tale is, it's a folklorist story, usually with a moral, but one which includes fanciful characters like uh, witches, wizards, dragons, giants, and animals who talk and act like people, and of course magic spells. And none of this relates to evolution at all, but all of it describes Genesis perfectly. Perfectly. It's there. You were checking off the list, and I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, it's in there. Yeah, it's in there. What are some of 
if not, if you want to run down the whole list, you can, of the foundational falsehoods of creationism. What are we talking about? Well, as you uh, as you probably know, I started out uh, getting into these online discussions of what they did, the Crevo conspiracy, creation versus evolution, uh, in places like alt.talk.creationism and talk.origins back in the days of Usenet. And I noticed that uh, I kept getting the same comments over and over and over again. And whenever you, when, it, when believers are arguing with something, they'll ask you a question they think you can't answer. And then when they see that you can answer, they'll interrupt that answer. So to ask you another question, hoping to find the question you can't answer. And they'll ignore all the answers you have given to say, see, you, you come to a point where you can't answer. Well, we don't know everything, and you know what? Neither do you. You're just lying when you say that you do. Because as Peter Boghossian says, you know, faith is pretending to know what you don't know. And sometimes you know you don't know. You're just making that assertion. So I got tired of repeating the same arguments back and forth at people, and, and instead of just composing a new statement, you know, I would just go and say, you know, I'm just going to copy and paste what I said to the last guy. You know, oh, wait, that last guy was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and this was back, I think you produced the videos back when YouTube had a pretty strict time limitation and file size limitation. So That's right. in each of these clips, you're hauling ass. I mean, you are moving <laughs> through the content pretty fast. Well, there's a lot of information to put in. I think they had a, a maximum limit of 11 minutes on any user uploaded video. And some of these topics are quite large, quite voluminous. Like, a, So every all of them required that I talk fast. And in one of them, the 10th foundational falsehood in creation, uh, of creationism in particular, there was so much information that I just really had to stream through it just as quickly as I humanly could. And what I was noticing is, as you know, I'm repeating the same arguments again and again and again. I hear people say that um, there's no transitional species. Well, and I provide the list of transitional species. Well, there's no beneficial mutations, so I provide a list of beneficial mutations and so forth. And I just kept repeating the same things over and over again. So I remember putting them down together all as a list of the, the same recurrent arguments that I keep hearing that the Bible is the the word of God and then and and that you can you can interpret scriptures as 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 absolute knowledge and all of the your your personal conviction equals knowledge and so forth. And um oh and my favorite of all time, evolution is just a theory. You know <laughs> that's the biggest irritant for me. Over and I just upload and over and over. <laughs> it just won't go away will it yep and you can't ever get these guys to admit oh, okay well that's 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 what a theory is and i've misrepresented okay i won't do that again no that never happens because creationism is blatantly dishonest now i've i've had many conversations with creationists who were sincere believers as a matter of fact their sincerity is the reason they don't believe anymore but what ends up happening is when you're talking to a creationist they, and you get into this argument. Now, if they've never had this argument with anybody that knows what they're talking about ever before in their lives, then there's a certain degree of forgiveness I can give them. I mean, people believe what they do because everybody around them believes that, too. And, and even if it seems like nonsense to them, they think, well, if everybody else believes that there must be something valid to it, maybe I just don't understand. OK, I'll give you the, I'll give you that benefit of the doubt. But when you get into this discussion and you, you, you and I are online arguing this point then as a believer, you're going to be very quickly faced with a choice, whether to remain honest or whether to remain creationist, because you no longer have the option to be both. When you say words like evolutionist and evolutionism, it points, I think, to a tendency by religious people to see everything in religious language, right? When you and I speak at a convention, they say, oh, you're preaching, and if you have a gathering, they say, oh, you're having church. And yeah, uh, they tend to do everything in sort of churchy terminology, don't they? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the fifth and sixth uh, foundational falsehoods of creationism are exactly that. The, uh, the fifth one is that uh, evolution is a religion or faith is required to believe in evolutionism is the fifth one. And the sixth one is that evolution is supposed to account for the origin of life, the universe, and everything. Which, of course, one of the things that people don't understand is that evolution is just population genetics. That's really all it is. So you, it's, it's a theory of biodiversity. And so it can't say anything about the origin of life or the origin of matter or the origin of, of, of uh, the, the elements of the periodic table, planets, any of that. You know? so, but, but if you're going to replace God did everything 
with a whole flurry of scientific theories. And what they do is they, they, they bottle everything up into one tiny little package so that all of the scientists, uh, sciences against them are in one box. And they call that evolutionism just so that they can, can create the illusion of two equal options. And then if they can dismiss one that they don't understand, then they can continue to make believe in the other one, which they also don't understand. Arn, is it true that uh, all species are transitional species? I don't use that definition because while I understand it and I understand why other people would use that, when you're arguing against people who want to pretend that they're critics of evolution, they want a very specific definition of what a transitional species is. And so what I've actually found a definition that a, another young earth creationist website was using that was actually concordant with what scientists would identify, you know, uh, as specifically what is transitional. And, and so that gives, you know, a, a, an organism that seems to be or shows traits of uh, one uh, grade or lineage to another. Uh, or beginning a new line. Well, give me so some examples. Might, I mean, what's a transitional species? Okay, here's an example for you, a, a, a famous one. This is Eda, the 47 million, million year old monkey lemur that was discovered around 2010. Uh, she had, uh, she was basically a, a lemur type monkey. She's a cross between lemurs and monkeys. Now, you know, in in the anthrop or the the, the primate family tree has two divisions, and you have prosimians, which include your lemurs, and then you have actual simians, which equals monkeys, essentially. Uh, and with Eda, the, we, we didn't have something that joined them together, and, and Eda has the traits of both. So she is a transitional species because she joins both of those factions. That's one example. Another one, a, a better one probably, it is Acanthostega gonari. And Acanthostega is... For all intents and purposes, the Darwin fish. If everybody's seen the, the bumper sticker of the fish with feet, you know, that's that's Acanthostega, essentially. It is a fish that isn't a fish anymore, but yeah, but neither is it an amphibian yet. It's 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 a it's li literally a fish with legs and feet and toes. Have you seen the uh, I think there's a documentary of it and and a lot of work out there on Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish. Have you seen that? <laughs> I have. And Shubin is one of the people that I would actually like to interview on my podcast at some point because I, I like the work that he's done. And just he, he's he's a great example of somebody who's well trained in their field, but also very lucky with their, the, the finds that he made. I mean, like he was driving along somewhere and he just happened to look at a formation on the side of the road and he just found that rock formation interesting. And he stopped, and that's where he found his most famous find was just some, you know, he, I just want to go look at these rocks that I see on the side of the road. And that's where he found it. You know? I saw the, <laughs> he had examples on his, on this documentary, I think it's a three-part piece that's on Netflix, where he's interviewing people who have visible gills. So That I haven't seen yet. But no, I, it's, I mean, it's like, I've seen this movie. I, I was going to say, the, the, the video series that I did... You know, somebody initially challenges me to come up with this video series, and 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 I did this originally for her, and not just for her, but because I knew there was an audience for this, and and, and I knew that the wider audience was people that. I mean, you have to think about this. Church and you know religion goes door to door for free and sells itself to everybody, and they really want the people who don't know any better. They want to they want to get the children. They want to get the little old ladies. They want to get people with, who are undereducated, you know, because that's that's the source that they need. And if you're going to understand evolution, it requires a very specific, very detailed, very extensive education that also covers these particular topics. Right. And it's, so it's and it's a lot of investment of time and money and resources on every person in order to understand it. But, you know, religion, you have to combat because there's no money involved in that. That's just spread out for free to everybody so that it can then get their money in the form of tithe later on. So if I wanted to reach the, the, the massive audience, it would have to be for people who didn't have an advanced education. It would have to be for people who, who didn't have a long attention span. It is a study in contrasts, you know, creationism, Adam, Eve, God, garden, sin, Jesus, heaven, hell. I mean, you know, it's it's pretty basic. I'm not I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying. But once you get into the nuts and bolts of evolution, it's such a hugely, monumentally complex topic. It's overwhelming for some. And, of course, many of us were taught evolution not by scientists. We were taught evolution 
or to despise evolution, and we were taught by pastors, right? We, they didn't bring any evolutionary biologists into Sunday school to talk to us about evolution. They had pastors, people with seminary degrees, come in to talk to us about the science of evolution. Iron. Yeah, and then they would put warning stickers on your science books. Warning, this is just a theory, and not everybody believes this. Well, how come they didn't put warning stickers on the Bible in Sunday school? Warning, this is complete bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Has uh, the study of evolution sort of, this is a loaded question, I know the answer, but I'll ask you just to get you talking. The study of evolution really has ignited for you again and again the wonder of the world that we live in. I mean, it's at first it, it threatened my specialness when I was a believer, but now I look at it and I just think it's magical. I think it's amazing. I mean, the the processes of evolution are really wondrous things. There are so many different aspects as to it. You said that it was so voluminous before. I mean, and it certainly is. I mean, I I had a I had a I met a publisher at the American Humanist Association who who asked me to do that video series in the form of a book and and said that you know you had to flash all this information so fast in your video series we would we'd just like you to write a book of it and and, and expand the information you know you have, you, instead of just flashing into, into things that you know maybe people can look up later can you just explain the depth and breadth of it here and so I've got, you know, a chapter dedicated to uh, genetics and beneficial mutations. I've got a chapter dedicated to phylogenetics and a chapter dedicated to uh, macroevolution observed in the lab and so many different things. Now, let me, stop, tried not let me stop you. Hang on. What are, what's phylogenetics? Phylogenetics is the systematic classification of life forms, but it's not just taxonomy, which is what Linnaeus came up with 300 years ago, where you classify organisms based solely on their morphological, physical characteristics. Uh, phylogenetics is where you have its twin nested because it's also – uh, traceable via the genetic code. So that if you if you look up the the, the mutations and the locations of the mutations in everybody's in everybody's uh, uh, genome, then everything will match up to show where the where where the divergence is and what type of divergence it was. So it's like very much like getting a paternity test, you know, to verify whether you are the father, right? These kinds of tests can be done more in depth to identify whether organisms are actually related. And now they've got many different genomes that are being mapped where, it, where the human genome, the first one done, took this huge amount of time and money. They've now uh, made it uh, much more efficient and much more cost effective. So they're doing another genome every week or so. And um, they're, 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 they're discovering some you know, most, mostly confirmations on what they had already based on morphology, but now they're also coming up with a couple of corrections for things that the old-time taxonomists had maybe uh, had maybe created junk taxons, for example, you know, like colubrid snakes, not knowing how milk snakes and rat snakes and all like this are, are, are classified, so they just put them all in one taxonomy. The, the, the genome, the phylogenetics, identifies exactly precisely where they go. And there's been a couple of uh, discoveries in that, like, for example – uh, um, there were pangolins and aardvarks and anteaters that were once upon a time put in all one category because they didn't really know how to classify you know, toothless mammals. And it turns out that the pangolins, oddly enough, are like a uh, – they're, they're located just between carnivores and hooved animals and that aardvarks are actually more closely related to elephants – than anything else. I mean, anyway, there, there've been a lot of, there've been some confirmation. There's also been some corrections. So phylogenetics adds another tier. It's like the paternity test of the old Linnaean taxonomy. So the idea that you know, people would argue that, well, I didn't, you know, you, if you believe in evolution, you believe that cats give birth to dogs. Now, now this is a deliberate distortion. <laughs> 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 and it is deliberate because it's, it's, it's uttered by people who not only don't understand evolution, but they want to make sure they never do. Was it uh, something I had seen where they showed like the house cat and the tiger and the lion? And they say people are more than happy to classify these as cats. And then they show all these different you know, types of animals and how they are related and grouped in a certain way. And then they show, of course, chimpanzees and humans, and they're like, oh, no, they got nothing to do with each other. You know, they're absolutely <laughs> horrified at the idea that we might be classified as primates. 
a much better example of that is the, the transitions between chimpanzees and humans because you know there are there are dozens of fossil species that lie between these two groups uh, if chimpanzees and humans both evolved from a common ancestor and we now have several of those common ancestors in the fossil record and so they would be their their skeletal structure their skulls in particular are just as Darwin predicted, they're roughly halfway between what a chimpanzee's versus what a human's is. And when you ask creationists about this, they can never say that anything is to any degree transitional. So they would identify these skulls as either 100 percent ape or 100 percent human. And the beauty of it is, is that one creationist will identify this skull as 100 percent ape and another creationist will identify the same skull as a 100 percent human. And in the case of Dwayne Gish, who's the founder of the Institute of Creation Research, they asked him about this one skull, KMR, KMNR 1420, I think it was, and he identified it initially as 100 percent ape. And they brought him the same skull six years later and he identified it as 100 percent human. Uh, that's so awesome. the best way, that's beautiful. the best way to know, <laughs> the best way to know whether a whether a species is transitional or not is when creationists can't agree on which end of whichever imaginary line it is, but it's 100 percent on both, <laughs> according to who you ask. And by the way, I'm glad I'm not the only one who has barking dogs in the background while I'm trying to record a show. <laughs> it happens from time to time. Henry and Rad yeah, Dog. Give me a moment. I'll let these things in. That's all right. That's all right. We'll take a break. They'll, they'll quiet down after I do. All right. You had done something in a speech that I thought was really clever when you were talking about subspecies. You would actually use kind of a Windows folder system or a Windows Explorer folder system to sort of make it uh, a visual example for the audience to show that, you know, here's a species and then here's a subspecies and that subspecies. Can you kind of get into that for a second, kind of what you did and how it works? Yeah, that's uh, that that was a brilliant accident. Um, I wanted <laughs> <laughs> I wanted people to understand a, a, a systematic classification of life forms the way I do, and the only thing that would seem to illustrate that for people is the old system of a Windows Explorer, which they don't, oddly enough they don't even use anymore. But it, it used to be the little folders of folders within folders that the Windows Explorer used to have, and so I cre I I just copied these folders and created an animation based on them and just changed the names of all the subdirectories so that it would match, you know, phylogenetics so that people would understand what it means that, you know, that when you say ape, ape is not a species, ape is several species and that it happens to include gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees and humans and a number of fossil things too. But the only way for people to really understand that is to be able to click on the folder that says apes and then see all the things that come down out of it. You know, and and the same thing with uh, you know with with simians, for example. People don't understand what that it means that they are monkeys. Well, I'm not a monkey because I'm not a different species. I'm a different species than a monkey, and they don't understand that there are hundreds of species of monkeys. So this was a great way to illustrate all of that. And I, what it ended up happening was after I did that illustration or that animation, rather, um, I ended up getting, and I'm not kidding about this, hundreds of requests for this program. Now, although Windows no longer uses the Windows Explorer program, and it probably wouldn't even make sense anymore if I continued to use that format, but that answer has, or that request that those hundreds of people had made has finally been fulfilled. That program is now in the data entry stage. It is the Phylogeny Explorer program, and it's, it's being set up on a dedicated server. I've got a full-time admin who started, I think, uh, last month to... Uh, work, work full time on this in the construction of this and what we're doing, what we're trying to do. And I don't, I don't know when it's going to be unveiled because it's been a very long process so far. But we've got a number like at least a dozen or so volunteers that are fleshing it out. Um, we're filling up the entire uh, tree of life represented as a uh, as, as an online navigable web source. There were other attempts to do this in the past. There was one called the Arizona Tree of Life Project, which remains the best attempt thus far. But what they did with that was that they hired a bunch of PhDs, and then they started politicking against each other and eventually shut down the program. But what so we've done is avoid all of that. You don't need PhDs to build a web page. You can make it a peer-reviewed web source, which is what we're working towards. We will create the, the database. 
and turn it over to the scientific community to make it a living entity. And we wanted to make it a phylogenetic hub, but it's also going to be fully illustrated with uh, with every clade will have its own descriptions and uh, and and to, to give the value of what all of these means. You know, like, for example, uh, deuterostome, for example, uh, what does the deuterostome clade mean? It means that uh, that. As you develop, as as deuterostomes develop, there's there's a an orifice that develops. It's just a little cluster of cells early on, early on. The, about the only thing you are is a cluster of cells, and the first trait that you have is an opening that opens from one end to the other. Now, in most animals, proterostomes, that opening is a mouth that leads to an anus on the other side. That's the first development they have. But in us, the first opening is the anus first. So there is literally a point at which we are nothing but assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a punchline coming. I knew it was a matter of time. So, Arn, let's see which uh, which folder would he fall into? I mean, I was it. You know, when you look at him, the first thing you think is descendant of the wolf or related to the. I know that's the first thing that probably comes to mind. And actually, no, he just walked up to me while I was doing the interview, and I thought I'd. Yeah, no offense to your little dog, but that is such an argument against intelligent design. <laughs> Don't listen. Don't listen, buddy. So do yeah. you talk the, the in thing- foundational falsehoods, do you talk about species versus kinds? It's another one that I hear quite a bit, and I'm like, what? what's a kind? Yeah, no, there is no definition of kind, but I do, I do in my book go into some of the the ways that the the Bible contradicts itself as to what a kind is. For example, I mean, birds are supposed to be a kind, but then it's it's all kinds of birds, or all sorts of birds, and so I wait. Well, what what is a kind? What is a sort? And what? Why are there different kinds of birds? Why aren't they all one kind? Why would you have multiple kinds of birds if, if bird is a kind by itself, right? So you have a parent category and then you have sorts of birds. So you have subcategories of that too. So all of this means is that the Bible was written by people who had no idea what they were talking about, literally, is what that means. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, what are some of the other foundational falsehoods? I mean, they're obviously going to have to read the book or watch the video series. I would hope they'd support the book. Is it something that someone like me can digest? Because this is not my area of expertise. I'm learning from the experts in the field. Is it something I can participate in? As I was recording the audio book, um, David Smalley, I was recording in his studio at Dogma Debate, and he 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 had a kind thing to say about the book. He says one of the, he said that the best thing about my book was that each chapter stands by itself, and that you, know, you can argue when 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 people bring up you know when somebody brings up a foundational falsehood, you can just present that that one chapter, and that's what the original video series was about. You know, presenting that one chapter as an answer to that question. Uh, the first foundational falsehood is that um, that is the false dichotomy that there is either God creating without evolution or evolution creating without God, that if you that if you accept evolution is true, then you can't be a theist or that if you're going to be a Christian, then you have to reject science. You know, this is this is religious extremism. And I go into in that chapter, I go into a list of uh, different mainstream scientists and including the founders of evolutionary science. All of the fathers of evolutionary science were were Christian, you know, uh, and, and many of them still are. And so that is a false dichotomy. And there's a lot of other uh, similar arguments like uh, there's been no beneficial mutations. Again, I got a whole list of them. You know, and, and when, when we get into that, uh, oh, it's, that, that creation is evident. Oh, here's a good, ar- here's a good one. The one I often heard, evolution is a fraud. It's a hoax because they, they found a, a tooth in Nebraska and some magazine thought it was a, you know, those arguments – what we actually see is that creation science, which is another found, another foundational falsehood in a different chapter, what we actually see is that people trying to promote creationism would take stories from evolution and try to play it up like evolution was being some Illuminati conspiracy being foisted against the public. And yet there, there actually is a whole long list of deliberate flawed, frauds and hoaxes perpetuated by creationists in order to support the idea of their particular church or God. And that in the entirety of, of uh, evolutionary history, there has not been one hoax perpetuated by what they would call evolutionists against what they would call creationists. You know, you've got one hoax 
that was perpetuated by nobody knows who against evolutionary science. There was uh, the uh, the Piltdown Man was was created to humiliate the British Museum of Natural History. That was their target. So evolution, in a sense, was the victim of that hoax, not the perpetuator. And it was also evolutionary scientists who discovered that hoax and who exposed it. So, you know, uh, the hoaxes, creationists never expose a hoax. If they knew how to expose a hoax, there wouldn't be creationists. <laughs> I just like to see you get worked up about creationism. I mean, it's got, I know how <laughs> frustrating it is. Uh, and I get frustrated sometimes with myself, Aaron, for holding to it for as long as I did. I think sometimes I just checked out, right? I just blinked. I just put my fingers in my ears and said, God is good. I want to go to heaven. I'm terrified of going to hell. Therefore, I believe the Bible, and the Bible says this. Didn't you have a—I'm remembering a, a relatively— famous or infamous story about you being in somebody's office and you got the equivalent of no, 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 you know, and they put their hands over their ears. I mean, they just shut down, did they not? Yeah, I remember talking to this friend of mine that was uh, that was now a young earth, young earth creationist evangelical minister. And when he would try his standard arguments to to shut down people who didn't know any better, and now he's talking to somebody that's actually invested years of his life in exploring this controversy. And what I'm explaining is the irrefutable, verifiable actuality of the situation. And he can't, won't accept what he's hearing. And he must dismiss it because this is a requirement. This is a priori. You have to believe Right. You have this uh, this ultimate reward that you will only get if you believe hard enough. Well, he's also and, got belief equity going on. You spend so many years, so many decades investing yourself in a belief. If you admit that it's wrong, that whole house of cards just comes crashing down. Exactly. And so here I am giving demonstrable, verifiable proof that the things he was just telling me are all wrong and that the things that he has believed his whole life are all wrong. And he remained very pleasantly smiling, very, very friendly, very, you know, because he's got to maintain this facade. But the thing is, as you could see, there was something about his eyes just didn't look real anymore. <laughs> I was suddenly looking at a mannequin. He's all they kind of have that condescending smile, and they nod, and, oh, you poor thing. I, I could Aaron. tell no, that thing. he was chanting mantras in his mind to make sure that he doesn't hear or acknowledge anything that I say. And this is very off. This is a fun thing. If you ever get into into these discussions with religious believers, they, they will never admit any error. They will change the subject. And when they want to change the subject, you know, when you say there's no transitional species, you start presenting transitional species, and they say, well, there's never been any beneficial mutations or whatever. Don't let them change the subject. Let's go back to get them con to concede what a transitional species is. How do they admit that this is what it is? They won't do it because they can't. And this is where there's a difference between – this is important. There's a difference between religious belief and free thought. Now, free thinkers they often call themselves free thinkers, but a lot of believers don't understand what that is because I've heard believers tell them tell me that they are free thinkers. Really, so you're you're free to believe that Jesus was a myth and never really happened, and, and you're you're free to to accept that evolution is real. If I show you the evidence of it, and of course you're not free because religion is a belief system. That means it has required beliefs and it has prohibited beliefs. You are required to believe this and you are forbidden to believe that. And if you don't have any of these required beliefs or prohibited beliefs, then you're a free thinker. Your salvation is not dependent on whether you believe and you're not going to be penalized for whether you don't believe. I was having dinner with a friend, religious friend, and uh, they said, uh, you know what? You'll never change your mind. You, I don't care what I say about Jesus, a Christian. You'll never, ever change your mind. You'll never, you're so set in your ways, that will never change. You're not the kind of person who is prepared to change their mind. And I looked right at him and I thought, have we met? I mean, it has already happened <laughs> once in my life uh, where I, everything changed. If you look at my life now as opposed to 15 years ago, I changed my mind. 
and followed new information, followed the evidence. It's already happened once. I'm prepared for it to happen again. Aaron, if Jesus was to appear tomorrow and it was measurable and science could get its mitts on the Jesus phenomenon, would you change your mind? If science could get its mitts on the Jesus phenomenon, then yes. But if it only happens for me, that's not good enough. Jesus appears to you in a dream or hell, he knocks exactly. on your back door with a you know, plate of cookies. It doesn't matter because, <laughs> I, I, because I know, like, you remember George Harrison of the Beatles? And this is in the third foundational falsehood of creationism. George Harrison had a personal relationship with Krishna. That if you chant the mantras that Krishna wouldn't, you wouldn't just believe in Krishna, he would physically appear, that he would be there where you could see him and you could hear him and you could have a conversation with him. Now, this is all what we would accept as a delusion, but Christians do the same thing. They just don't do it as well. And then I have a friend that that, uh, that I've known for many years who says that Bast, the Egyptian cat-headed goddess, physically appeared in his house, gave him a hug and told him to become her disciple. So, of course, he did. Oh, where do you meet these people? Uh, I'm surrounded <laughs> by just the most vanilla flavor of Christianity, and you've got people who worship cat gods. I mean, how, how do you make these friends? They'd be a hell of a lot more interesting in many ways, for sure. R- real fast, and I'm, I'm going to let you go here in a few because I know you have many things to do, but let's come back to the audiobook. So you've released, or you are releasing, what's the release date for Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism? That is November 1st. Okay, November 1st. And you have a supplemental audio version of it, an audio book with you reading it. How cool is that? Because people love your voice. It's kind of this round, deep, authoritative. It's distinct. People dig that. So I think they'd really dig the audio book, too. I want to thank you for that. And and, uh, David Smalley at the... uh we were recording at the the Dogma Debate Studios. He's been he's been very diligent about maintaining the professionalism. It makes me reread quite a lot when he wants me to put the inflection a little bit better on on something. He just likes to tell you what to do. I think. So. I, I think that's probably do it, it again. Yeah. Damn it, with feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because sometimes just the way that you say it can also add to people's ability to understand what you're saying. So I mean, I'll appreciate that. I absolutely. Can do that. You know, there's a lot to do with inflection and cadence and he's got a good ear for that and uh, and I think you're a good communicator I'm looking forward to the book myself I'm looking forward to seeing it finally come to fruition you know it's funny we have bumped into each other over the years and I'm always like how's the book coming oh, I'm working on it I've just been real busy how's the book coming oh I'm, I'm traveling I'm going to Ireland oh, how's the book coming oh I'm doing I'm going to Australia see at the unholy Trinity. I mean it's been going on for years and years and years and so this for you is like Man, I mean, this is the Super Bowl. You have worked. Oh, look. Who's this? <laughs> this is Bowie. It's Bowie because he has one eye that's a different color than the other eye. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely <laughs> adorable. Absolutely. He's a Dachshund Corgi, and this breed is called a Dorgi. What is it about the tummy rub? It's like the universal dog. <laughs> it's sort of a cue for surrender. So Yeah. Aaron, I I wish you the best with the book. Thanks for spending the show with me, man. And uh, I will put the link. I think it's you can pre-order, right? You can mean even though it's not out till November first, people can go ahead and order. And when it's out, it'll be shipped, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, it won't be shipped immediately, but it, it, if when it when they have it in in print, and I think I think they have it now. So I'm not sure when they will actually begin. I I don't know how this works. This is my first book. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. For a a few reasons. One, I think, is the fact that it's another tool in the tool chest. You know, I was talking to Bogosian the other day about the Atheist app, and, you know, we're talking about doxastic openness, where someone comes to the point where they are willing to receive new information, right? It's no longer closed. You're not hitting a brick wall, but they're actually listening. And those occasions happen. They don't happen often enough. But if we can get to that point where people are listening and receiving new information, then having the good information really is a wonderful thing. And so this is a great resource, and I'm glad it's going to be there for us. Well, thank you very much. I wrote this uh, very much with the intent that the reader would be somebody who's looking to argue with me, that the reader would be somebody who doesn't want to accept what I'm telling them. And so I, it, I try to argue everything that way. And I, I, there's a lot of, if you have any sincerity to you at all, when you start this, if you were, if you're a sincere believer in creationism, then I, I really don't think you would be a sincere believer by the end. People love to argue with you anyway, man. I mean, you just attract it. I mean, I'll get it from time to time. They love coming after you. 
They just, you are red meat for the debate crowd. And so it's, it's going up to a whole other level. And uh, <laughs> But hopefully some good discussions will be had. I'm going to put the link in the description box. All success to you, my friend. And we have plans to have you as part of our 300th radio broadcast, my anniversary show. We're going to do a big thing in Dallas, Texas, kind of a one-day mini conference. And you've agreed graciously to come out and present and be a part of that day. So I will be seeing you here in just a few weeks. All right. Looking forward to that, sir. All right, Rob. Okay, I'll put those links in. And thanks to everybody for watching the foundational falsehoods of creationism in print and in audio releasing very, very soon.